So um, I founded this company called Baru. We are reinventing manufacturing supply chains. At the same time, we're helping small local businesses and saving the environment. So the way this, the way we're approaching it is we're taking existing but idle CNC robotics and tying them together into a virtual factory to reshore manufacturing back into our communities. That makes Baru super capital efficient. And we're addressing the wood furniture and the cabinet space first because it's a $35 billion market that wastes $15 billion on shipping and handling. And all of that shipping emits immense amounts of CO2 every single year, enough to uh, drive 2 million cars per year, actually. And then even though we're a software program and platform, we're creating demand for underused or for uh, displaced workers. And that by simply tapping into the idle time on the thousands of CNC machines that are already in, in, uh, in use all over the United States and all over the world. We've reinvented a brand new category called customer to manufacturer. So we have a patent on the use of augmented reality to control manufacturing. So if, if a customer is buying one of our pieces of furniture, they'll be able to use our app to be able to see it, change the colors and the material, resize it to fit. And when they're happy with the way it looks, they simply click buy and we deliver it in two weeks. We've connected a buyer's imagination with the code that drives a machine in their hometown. And by reducing the supply chain to a hometown process, not only do we reduce timing, but we also reduce immense amounts of cost structure. The existing $35 billion market is all crammed on the left side of this chart where retailers are offering limited selections in limited configurations, sizes, materials, and colors. We've expanded buyer's choices to every, almost every size and configuration. So we're expanding the market actually. And from that total potentially $40 billion market, we're gonna capture a big chunk of it by offering custom quality furniture and cabinetry at mainstream prices. We started our pilot when Google put us on their employee perks site. Googlers all over the country were starting, were bought custom sized desks for their home offices during COVID. We expanded to 29 cities with that pilot and now we're starting to scale sales. And also um, we just got noticed that the Department of Defense wants to see our patent to, to deploy it in their own operations. So we're scaling sales with cabinetry by establishing a dealer network. They can get ca custom cabinets and resell it at a 40% lower price than the, the typical custom maker. We have no shortages. We have, we're using superior materials and it's faster delivery because it's locally made. We can grow to a billion dollars in sales with zero manufacturing investment or inventory because it's all been deployed and all we're doing is buying the inventory, the materials on demand. By simply being in the top 60 metro areas, we'll be serving 225 million people, two thirds of the US population. Our growth path is by introduce, by achieving some market uh, sustainability in one region and then the existing 29 regions and then uh, with deeper penetration and as well, we're expanding our geographies also. We've got all the talent that we need to scale uh, Baru into a multi-million dollar run rate. Heidi is a superb operations um, professional. Uh, Leland was our first manufacturing partner, an expert in automation in this field and the former Cabinet Makers Association president. Constantine's full, a full stack developer. My own background is in corporate finance. We've had $352,000 invested by angels. We're raising a seed round of a million dollars, 700,000 will go into revenue acceleration and margin generation. So as we, as those margins accumulate and grow over the regions, we're reinvesting those margins into more sales acceleration and category expansion and product uh, growth. Well, this is the perfect time to join Baru and pour jet fuel on the fire. We're revolutionizing manufacturing. 
we're creating hometown jobs, we're rebuilding local economies and saving the environment. And your time is up. Awesome. Thank you, Tino. That was a, that was a great pitch. Uh, super excited about what you guys are doing, especially the, the reshoring jobs is a, is a big deal. Just the, the capacity. I remember you were telling me two hours a day, these machines are getting used. Uh, the rest of that's a, a total waste. I will, I will hand things over to Ryan first, since I've already had a, a crack at this one. Ryan, do you have questions for Tino and for, for Tino and for Baru? Yeah, thanks so much. And, you know, um, again, great to see you and, and uh, congrats on the success uh, the last uh, year or so. Um, it, it, just in terms of uh, thinking about sort of the entire life cycle of your product, can you just walk us through the, so obviously understand the impact of having lo more localized manufacturing plants, but, and I'm sorry if you went over this, but can you just uh, um, talk through the sort of supply chain and obviously scope three emissions is an important aspect of this, but how are you sort of thinking about the sustainability of the actual material that goes into this instead of just kind of the localized aspect of the manufacturing plant? Uh, and again, sorry if you walked us through this, but we would love to understand that a little bit more. Yeah, we can, uh, okay, we're, uh, our bill of materials is essentially comprised of uh, the materials that exist in, in a market. And so with more, and since these, so, these materials are generally sold nationwide, they, they generally uh, comply with uh, the most strict uh, regulatory standards like California's CARB II emissions and all of that. And, um, and these materials already exist in the market, so we're not bringing it in. Um, we choose to not bring it in to avoid the, the expense. And um, yeah, so the, uh, in terms of uh, carbon output, we're actually carbon negative because we've reduced it down to a hometown ecosystem footprint and we wipe it out by planting offsets. Got it. And so because it's localized and you get the materials from each individual city or region that you're in, does that mean that the products will differ based on which region you're, you're in? Or is there, uh, how, do you, how do you control for quality there then? Yeah, continent to continent probably. But for example, uh, the, the materials are generally made in big uh, centralized manufacturing factories and they're distributed to local, de local warehouses. And so that's how we achieve uniformity and quality control on the materials. And then, okay, and then, and then my last question is on, um, can you remind me how many manufacturing plants you have up and running right now? How many cities you have? Yeah, we are in 29 cities with um, generally one plant per city. Uh, and then how? And, but we'll be, able to, we'll, we'll be able to replicate. You know, there are about 4,000 of these machines out in the wild and in use. And so eventually we'll have overlapping geographies to, to introduce some competition on the supply side and all, also to um, provide some redundancy just in case we get like a big building order for the four, you know, four story, 40,000 square foot building, we can, we can distribute within the region to be able to supply in, in a timely fashion. Got it. And how long does it take to get a new, uh, a new city up and running or new region? About a week. Because uh, most of that time is uh, convincing the, the business owner that we're real. Afterwards, uh, you know, we're using the same software they are. And so they just take our file and open it up and it's ready to manufacture. Okay, great. Burrell? Uh, yeah, I have a couple of questions. The first one being, um, I mean, you're addressing so many issues with such a fantastic solution. Um, where do you see the bottlenecks in this process? Right now, we need we need a certain amount of funding to get the word out because it's a as as you you've as you've already addressed kind of in your question it's it's a story we have to tell that story we have to drive that awareness, and so um, yeah that's the bottleneck right now it's it's marketing. So it's tying in the whole story together, making it function wherever you choose to apply it. Yeah, because uh, the the manufacturing you know we've we've proven it amply. We've proven it amply. We've replicated in the 29 cities with even with low volumes. That just means that higher volumes will be easier to attract that supply side network. Yeah. Um, and then I guess 
cost wise, what does a typical table or cabinet look? I mean, not kitchen cabinet, because I understand that's definitely more expensive, but let's just say like upright standing table cost compared to a conventional one. Yeah, the well, every well, it's uh, for furniture, it's a little bit more, uh, more pricey than. Uh, at this point, because we haven't achieved the material scales and uh, material yield equation uh, of volume. But with the cabinetry, we're selling at about 30% higher price than IKEA mm -hmm. and competing with custom makers that are selling at 5x IKEA. And so that's that's how we can get dealers because we can be selling at a, a pretty reasonable price. They can do a markup to achieve a price point to their customers at a, at a, a level similar or approaching custom. Mm -hmm. um, and my final question is, I mean, it sounds like you have, uh, in terms of the whole process and everything, it's, um, it's fantastic that you've chosen to apply it to manufacturing, but it sounds like you have some sort of algorithm that can have a lot of impact elsewhere. Have you considered like applying that in other derivatives in like a licensing model or something like that? Yeah, of course. Um, uh, the first continuation of our patent is, uh, um, yeah, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of potential in, you know, what you see is what you get manufacturing. Yeah. So right now you're focused on manufacturing. <laughs> well, it's, it's also the software application, you know, uh, because the patent is on the use of augmented and virtual reality, not simply as a uh, data reporting device, but as a configurator for the manufacturing. Mm. So as you're configuring the virtual object, either in a, you know, in, in an architectural setting or in a, in a repair situation for the military, that is translating into the engineering file and into the manufacturing instructions. That direct link is what, we've what we had patented. Okay, thank you. So in theory, you could offer that as a service to architect design firms that want to have a super high-end experience and let their customers come in and customize it all and see how things change. We're already talking with architects because, uh, you know, we're, um, we're in discussions with a few companies that would benefit from using Revit. So using um, our technology and creating those Revit families, they can show their clients in VR, the room, and as the client is making co uh, comments, those those products in, in the Revit environment in VR can be dynamically changed and, and, and they're already pre-constrained pre and pre-configured for manufacturing, immediate manufacturing. And so, yeah, it's, yeah, it's an exciting future. What type of traction have you got with designers with architects with home builders in terms of if if you get one of those type of firms on board how many clients are they bringing you how often what what do the numbers look like if one if if a medium sized arch, uh, uh, architecture firm is building 10 buildings uh, nationwide what we offer them is uh, always local de-risked low risk manufacturing and supply of their interior case goods and if a typical building is 50,000 square feet that's got $500,000 of uh, casework you know built in cabinetry and and so it, it it scales pretty pretty rapidly and um our um supply side there is no real limit there are so many of these machines how long does it take to get a um, a builder, a designer, an architecture firm on board? What's the sales cycle look like? The uh, there's um, there it's a conservative industry, so that takes time, and that's why I'm focused on dealers because uh, dealers they're already confronting their clients' problems. They're trying to solve uh, solutions for the clients. Often the the the, the you know, the standardized size solution that cabinets come in at a reasonable price point does not solve those problems sufficiently. So we're introducing a custom, you know, at each one of our cabinets, you can order in thousands of size variants. And so that really solves a, 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 an implementation problem for these kitchen designers, showrooms and designers and, and dealers.